This is statistically insignificant, a scream into the void in audio and visual form. My name is Tess, my pronouns are she and they, and I will be your statistical guide for this evening's entertainment. With me is Bart. Hi, Bart. Hey, Tess. Uh, I go by he and him, and I will be your idiot guide for tonight's <laughs> That's not <entertainment>. fair. <laughs> I would also like to take a moment to extend my congratulations, which are more timely uh, at point of recording than they will be when this released, to the people of Berlin, who wrote, voted recently to the, the, use the constitutional power to forcibly acquire property for the public good in order to pry the sticky fingers of huge corporate landlords off of thousands of homes and nationalise them. It is, unfortunately, not a binding resolution, but hopefully it can become binding as soon as possible, because that would be very funny to see. Also, you know, people do need their housing. That's not just about my entertainment. Because it also came with certain victories for the left wing in the parliamentary elections as well, so that's more likely to get it through, right? Fingers crossed. I mean, it will be a hell of a fight for them, because... Well, this is a huge threat to Damani, and uh, Damani being threatened always tends to lead to things uh, fighting back. Yeah, of course. Today, we are going to be talking about work and employment. Particularly, we're going to look at how unemployment statistics are defined and measured in Australia, the political choices that go into those, and talk a bit about the history of labour in that context as well. Generally speaking, these stats are used for internal government policy decisions, but that includes things like rates of welfare support, federal setting of interest rates, and various decisions around community welfare as well. So it really does impact everything from potentially your mortgage, if you have a mortgage, to whether or not you can get access to unemployment support. First off are our definitions. These are used by the Australian Bureau of Statistics, the ABS, and various levels of governments here as well. The definitions have changed a bit over the years, and we will be using the most recent standards, which are laid out in a 2018 report. The reference will be in the show notes. They're built from a bunch of conferences among labour statisticians under the International Labour Organization, or ILO. I'll put references to those in the show notes as well. It's a very deep bureaucratic rabbit hole. And uh, this figure one is my experience of trying to work out what on earth is going on with the different slightly overlapping but not quite definitions between the international and the Australian standards. It's weird, and some of it (laughs) depends on what you are trying to measure at any given time. For the audio-only audience, it's the guy from Always Sunny in Philadelphia ranting about his conspiracy wall. I feel like this a lot, to be perfectly honest. I do too, but about conspiracy theories. (laughs) There are three primary groups we need to talk about. Who is employed, who is unemployed, which together make up the labour force. Which isn't as cool as it sounds. Yeah, I would very much like to see armed workers, you know. They, <laughs> they're terrified of militant unions, make them militarised. <laughs> and separate to this are those who are not participating and not considered part of the labour force. This is for the civilian population of people 15 and over, and it does not include... Uh, overseas tourists and things who are not regular residents of the country. The labour force is also called the economically active population, which I think is a bit on the nose because it implies that the people who aren't within the framework of the labour force aren't doing anything that is economically productive. That's a bit questionable and we'll get to that a little more. The employed people are defined as at work or not at work due to a temporary absence for at least one hour in the week with a survey that the statistic covers. This also includes illegal work, by the way. So the grow operation in your mate's basement counts as a job for him. Hell yeah. (laughs) Also included are owner-managers of both incorporated and unincorporated companies and enterprises and contributing family workers. So someone working on their parents' farm, their restaurant, or the in a shop or something, but doing so without being paid counts as employed, even if they're not getting money for it directly. Um, How about doing childcare and things like that? Oh, we'll get to that. It's a major sticking point for me. Unemployed people have zero hours of work, are available for employment, so they're not like off because of an injury or something, and are actively looking for work. And this looking for work part of it is a very interesting political decision because it means that people who have no source of income but are not looking for work because maybe they've been actively discouraged or abused out of the workforce by shitty bosses or whatever 
do not count as unemployed for the purpose of these statistics. So if you are trying to use employment or unemployment statistics as a representation of the like economic welfare of your average person, there's a gap there. And it's a very, very important one if you are interested in how people are actually living. So when it comes to things like uh, intergenerational unemployment, would that also be excluded by that definition? Yeah, so if if an individual between the generations has been discouraged from looking for work for whatever reason, like including a family in situation which was not supportive enough to set them up to participate in the cap or supportive in the right way, I should say, to participate in the capitalist economy, they would certainly probably not show up in this. Right. Now we have the people who are not participating. These are known as not in the labor force. I am not joking, they are called NILFs. Oh, great. Another thing that we're too brain breaking to laugh. <laughs> I know, <laughs> right? <laughs> my partner of the show, my partner Dean, tried to convince me that we should title this Hot NILFs in Your Area. <laughs> This is everyone 15 and over who is not in the military, not a tourist from overseas, and not actively looking for work is basically collected in this bucket. They're also referred to as uh, neither unemployed nor employed, not currently economically active, if NILF is a little bit on the nose for you. People who count under this classification include students, people who are retired, people who are unable to work due to short or long-term health problems or disabilities, and people who are doing unpaid care work, housework, and the like at home. I'm just going to put everyone else here. Oh, so that's not productive work, eh? No, it's not, right? For me, this is a bit of a sticking point. We'll talk about it more later, but to consider the housework, which keeps people fed and able to go out and generate value under capitalism, not economically productive... It's some bullshit. The cost, the labour still happens. It's just hidden from these economic metrics. And oh boy, have the feminists had a thing or two to say about that over the years. <laughs> we have a collection of statistics that the ABS calculates from this. So I'm going to introduce some notation to make this easier. We're going to notate the employed people as E, the unemployed people as U, and the people who are not participating in the labor force, we're going to call that, we'll just write that as NILF, why not? So the number in the labor force is the number of employed people plus the number of unemployed people. And we'll call that L, because it's easier. Then the unemployment rate is not, as some people think, how many people in the general population don't have a job. Instead, it is quite specifically the percentage of unemployed people within the labor force. This is calculated as the number of unemployed people divided by the size of the labor force, which you can write L or we'll just write it as E plus U, right? So that's the size of the labor force. Yes. That's the number of people who are unemployed times 100 to give it a, to make it a percentage or a rate per 100, right? Yes. This discounts the fact that there is a bigger population involved in the community who may not be working. It just looks at those people within the labor force. The number of people not working is actually bigger than the unemployment statistic implies because it doesn't count everyone who is not working. Yes. And that's, oh, that's a, a politically charged thing. And that's a decision that is made to reflect different aspects of working under capitalism effectively. The unemployment rate, in many respects, is a measure of who is not properly, in quotation marks, engaged in capitalist value generation. Yes. Except the people who are engaged in capitalist <laughs> yep. generation of income. But, uh, who they capital. don't count. Yeah, yeah right. The NILFs, Yes. So separate to that, we have what's called the participation rate. So this is the uh, this is the percentage of the adult civilian population who are in the labor force. So this is where you can capture whether people have stopped looking for work or are retired or are students and that sort of thing. So in this case, we want the labor force, so E plus U, divided by everyone who's considered in this population. So that's E plus U, plus the NILFs. EU NILFs. Times one. Exotic. 
<laughs> yes. Plus, oh, sorry, times 100 because we did give it as a percentage. Then lastly, we have the employment to populations ratio, which is the percentage of that adult civilian population who are actively employed, where this is the unemployment rate within the labor force. This looks at the employment rate within the, within the adult population. So what we get here is employment to population ratio. All right, so this is the employed people divided by the adult population. So E plus U plus NILF. And this is arguably a much better representation of how much of your population actually has an income than the others. It doesn't cover everybody who has an income because like if you get money from a trust fund or something or um, other sorts of investments, that's not necessarily counted as a job. But it's a better representation of who's engaged in value creation for capitalism effectively. Oh, so would a um, institutional investor or yeah, someone with a trust fund or whatever be counted as a NILF? That's a hard one because to some extent it's self-determined, right? So if somebody who had a whole bunch of investments said, yes, I spent an hour last week managing my investments, that could count as like basically self-employed. Oh, okay. So that would, st yeah, that would still count to them as having a job. Just like I can imagine any number of landlords claim that they have a job because they spend an hour or whatever thinking about their tenants. Yeah. So it's, it's a little bit complex in terms of what counts as work for people who are rent seeking. Yeah. But it's also kind of self-defined in that respect. Uh, so it's like those surveys they do of uh, CEO work hours where they're like, Oh, yeah, counts yeah, as work right. when I go to the gym and read a book. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Reading a book is um, expanding your understanding of your field. <laughs> I'm a researcher. I count that as work. <laughs> so let's have a look at the examples, because sometimes, at least for me, it's quite hard to comprehend this stuff when it's just written like an economist would with letters instead of numbers. So let's imagine we have 100,000 people in our population. So uh, for, this, the, for the purpose of making this easy, we'll consider this to be the adult civilian population of regular residents, which is the people who are covered by these statistics, yeah. right? We have 37,000 NILFs. We have 58 employed. And we have 4,200 unemployed all right our labor force is then the sum of these two so it is 58,800 plus 40 plus 4,200 which is 63,000 We have our unemployment rate, which is 4,200 divided by 63,000 times 100, which is 6.7%. We have our participation rate. which is 63,000 divided by 100,000 times 100, which is 63%. And we have our employment to population ratio. Which is 58,800 divided by 100,000, which is 58. 8%. Okay. Now, I want to do something with this to demonstrate the weakness of the unemployment rate as a statistic for population welfare and income, which is, let's say, 500 of our unemployment people, unemployed people stop looking for work. 
for whatever reason, they drop out of the workforce per se. Maybe they've been in a lockdown due to coronavirus, <laughs> for example. So what happens then? I, I'm going to write this uh, original 6.7% unemployment rate down here. Yep. To keep, uh, to keep it handy. So what changes here? First off, the number of NILFs goes up because these people who were unemployed move into the NILF category. So that becomes 37,500. The number of employed doesn't change because they weren't employed anyway, so they're not in that category. And the number of unemployed people changes. It goes from 4,200 to 3,700. So what changes in the other calculations? Our labor force has shrunk by 500 people. So that becomes 3,700. So the overall number is now 62,500. Which means that our unemployment rate has also changed. So now we have 3,700 out of our 62,500, which is, if I can find it, 5.9%. It's a miracle. Oh, on, Unemployment guns. has dropped. <laughs> yeah, right? What, what a world we live in. <laughs> the participation rate has also dropped because we've gone down to uh, 62,500, which is 62.5%. And the employment to population ratio hasn't changed because these people weren't employed anyway. Yeah. So we've gone down to 5.9% unemployment, even though all that's happened is a bunch of people are no longer like looking for yes. work. Looks great on paper though, right? Oh, if you're the government, you're, that's what you're aiming for. Really. <laughs> so I'll just note here that there are also specific statistics for youth unemployment, which is restricted to those 15 to 24, and employment to working age population people, which excludes people older than 64. So retirees are counted under NILFs in this, yeah. but if you want to exclude them, you can do that. Um, is there any reason why the army is excluded as an employer? I don't know for sure. I think some of it is that despite the efforts of imperialism, they are not considered to be generating value for capitalism, which is ironic, <laughs> but they are still have an income and are like, can afford yeah. to live so to some extent if you are using this as a metric for who can afford to live in your society which it's not necessarily a great metric for that but if you are using it in that way people who are being paid by the army don't really fit into that scheme of yeah, work okay. in media the government tends to talk about unemployment rates which is only one of these and as we have seen slightly problematic it can disguise very real problems. We have had a lot of people who are unemployed and stopped looking for work because of the lockdown, and the unemployment rate has dropped. It's a COVID <clears> miracle. <throat> Those people don't now have an income, and because of the way, for the international listeners, because of the way our, our welfare system works, if you are unemployed, you get endlessly abused by Centrelink, which is the um, like government body that oversees unemployment benefits. And you have to be looking for work in order to get that financial support anyway. So people who drop out of the labor force don't get access to Centrelink support either. So poverty rates skyrocket. You really have to look at the participation rate as well. And this is something that doesn't get talked about very much in a lot of media outlets. Like the ABC does and the Guardian does and some others. But... I haven't seen a hell of a lot from places like The Australian or certainly Sky News and The Telegraph will talk about unemployment, but they will not talk about participation rate or actual, I don't know, poverty rates, for example. Because you can look at household income. These surveys that produce these statistics do also ask people, what's the income of your household? What do you get paid with wages and that sort of thing? That data exists and is collected, but it's not quite so pretty doesn't look good for the government in particular. I do assume that the Australian will start talking about the participation rate when Labor is next in power. <laughs> um, I don't know. I wouldn't put it past <laughs> them, but at the same time, like, it's it's not something that is in people's minds as a statistic in the way that unemployment Certainly. is. 
And of course, when you start talking about the participation rate like that, you start getting questions like, oh, so like 40% or whatever of people aren't producing stuff. What's going on there? Uh, which includes retirees. And we can't have the Murdoch press looking too closely at them. Yeah, fair. Even though that's <laughs> their entire <laughs> business model yeah, is they're... selling to <laughs> retirees. The retirees. Exactly. That's why you can't look too close <laughs> in, the, uh, in a capitalist system, right? So one important distinction in the ABS definitions compared to what the International Labour Organization talks about is that of own use production work. So this is a term that the ILO uses in the 2013 conference that they had to refer to forms of work which are done for the use of an individual or household directly. So this includes growing stuff in your garden. If you're a farmer, it includes eating your own project, produce. It can also be services that are basically necessary for survival. In older documents uh, from the ILO, like 1985 definitions, this explicitly excluded childcare, housework, and cooking. But in 2013, those, there was a resolution to include those things. So this is a way that you can count the work that is done at home to keep people alive, to keep them functioning under the forms of work and forms of labor. Um, is the ILO like an international trade union body or how do, what, what's it? It's basically a, a body of trade unions, various like company executives and all the rest of it. But there, there is a little bit more equal voice, I suppose, within it. Okay. And shitloads of statisticians and data analysts. It's a body that in many respects, kind of, it, it, and it's involved with the UN, sets standards for how do you measure the work that is done? How do you measure um, income and things like that across international borders? So that governments and international bodies like the UN have a reasonable data set to yeah, work okay. with. Not everything that they um, talk about is adopted locally, though. So Australia ratified the 1985 stuff, and uh, I think some additional recommendations from 1998, but it has not, as far as I can tell at least, included all of the 2013 changes. There is a conservatism within the ABS about this sort of thing, and that may take a couple of generations to shift. Frankly, it's quite annoying, yeah. actually. We have these other metrics that the ABS doesn't appear to measure itself, and the way that it talks about unemployment and employment and work is kind of measuring a different thing, because th the unpaid labor that is done in the home is a different sort of work than paid labor within a workplace precisely because it is private, it is at home, and it's unpaid. So you do need to measure both, but to just not measure the stuff that happens at home or not have a framework to deal with it, kind of sexist, kind of capitalist, just Absolutely. a shred, right? Wait, um, so does the ABS, how does the ABS collect that data? Is it done? We'll talk about okay. that in a second. Before then, Another thing to consider is underemployment. So this is usually combined with the unemployed population to give metrics about underutilized labor, so people who could work but are not. And what the ABS measures is what I what they call time related underemployment. So this is people who are employed but want to and were available to work additional hours. Casualization of the workforce feeds into this to some extent in the sense that many casual workers do not have as many hours as they would like, but it doesn't fully capture the experience because you could have someone working full time, which to the ABS is more than 35 hours per week across two or three jobs, or have one job which has 35 hours or more but is desperately insecure or just doesn't pay enough. People who are looking to change their job for reasons like uh, doesn't pay enough, working conditions are shit, I have three jobs because none will employ me for more than eight hours at a time because then they have to pay me benefits, or I'm working 60 hours a week and want to drop back. These are also considered underemployed, as are people who are changing field because there is a skill mismatch with their work. But this is considered an inadequate employment situation, and the ABS doesn't measure that directly. 
so it's not reflected as under underemployment in the release statistics, basically because it's very hard to measure that. Basically, everyone would like more money for what they do. So to right, so to some extent, if you are capturing that part of it, you basically include everyone in that statistic, and it becomes meaningless. But if you are doing a more detailed analysis of how people experience work, you can tease out these aspects and look at, well, how does my income relate to whether I can afford food, for example, whether my landlord is basically forcing me out because I can't afford Sydney rent price, <laughs> yeah. for example. So there are a lot more aspects of the income side of things which aren't really reflected in unemployment statistics. They can show up in like wage stats, but you have to, that's not talked about quite so much for reasons that we'll get to if we talk about the history of these things. We haven't talked about uh, income stats in this. We also haven't talked about jobs because they are also measured in these surveys, but they are somewhat askew from unemployment, right? Because if you are unemployed, you do not have a job. But if you are employed, you could have multiple jobs. And you, that, that mismatch, it's not a one-to-one -one association, which can make it a little bit tricky to see yeah. what's going on. Also, job vacancies are themselves a convoluted measurement situation because not everything that gets posted on Seek or in uh, newspaper classifieds, if they still have those, I don't know, I don't read newspapers, those may or may not exist these days. And I don't know about you, but I have friends who have been targeted by various online scams that try to get you to sign up for work packages and then pay fees to them and they disappear and you don't get a job. Yeah. Highly illegal, but it does happen, right? There's also uh, bullshit like zero hours contracts in the UK, which means that you can be nominally employed, but you don't get any hours, you don't get any money. That would be counted as underemployment here, but you would still be considered employed, even if your boss isn't giving you any actual work. Right, but even if you didn't do an hour's work within the week? Yeah, so if you are temporarily not at work, but you still have an ongoing employment contract, you would be counted oh, as okay. employed. Yeah, so this includes if I was on a holiday for two weeks, for example, I yeah. still have a job, but I would not at work in that reference week. Let's talk about how that is measured, actually. So every month, the ABS does a labour force survey, which goes to calculate these statistics. And the questions get asked on the census as well, which is used to benchmark the um, monthly data. The questions themselves refer to the week immediately prior to the survey being done, rather than other weeks in the month. So you get like a snapshot of one week out of every month and that gives you your statistics. This can have issues from a sampling perspective in that if there is no one periodic behavior month to month, so if you know that there is a monthly spike in employment or unemployment, people getting new jobs or losing jobs at the end of the month or at the start of the month, you have to be a bit careful with your snapshot in either capturing that or avoiding that in order to better represent the overall situation. Yes. I can imagine, for example, December in hospitality being an interesting one for that. Yeah, it is a hard one. And like... Uh, in general, the ABS has slightly different uh, measurement procedures around Christmas and New Year because so many people do or do not work for that period. So if, you, if you're using that as a reference period, it can give you problems in your data. Yeah. The survey is based on a household as a unit. So if my household was chosen, that would involve interviewing myself and my partner with the two people who live here. If you get a share house of five people in the right age range, all of them would be interviewed. This gives about 50,000 people all up in ev any given survey period, but a particular household is signed up and does eight, an eight month stretch. They have staggered start time, so at any point in time you have 50,000 people, 26 odd thousand households, but an eighth of them rotate out each month and they get replaced with a new lot. It is a way of giving you kind of overlapping slices of time across a household. So instead of having uh, everyone, your whole 50,000 are there for eight months, then you get a new batch, you have continuity. 
and you can see how like that time the timelines change over time and there may be a pattern to that which is observable in this so how, it does make sense i was just going to ask Sorry, how did how would a household be signed up for this like the ABS has a record of addresses in Australia that it so you uses get like for a letter, this. like jury, jury, or um, I don't know how they actually go about contacting you. It wouldn't surprise me if they mail you something. They may knock on your door because they have people that go and do in-person interviews. During COVID lockdowns, it's probably they call you or they send you a letter, and then there's online fill-outs as well that you can do, just like the census was online. Um, but they do actually have people who go out and work as interviewers for the ABS to collect yeah, this right. data. It's a huge process every month to do this, as yeah, you might sure. imagine. This structure also does miss people. So if you don't have a fixed address that the ABS that, that shows up under the ABS, for example, if you're houseless or you're living in your car, you're not going to be included in this survey. And that can be a particular problem because you have people who, I don't know, work in farms and um, move around during picking season, for example, living in their cars. They have work, but they're not, they don't have an address, so they're not really covered by this statistic. Yeah. You also have unemployed people who do not have housing. They're not covered by this either. Would they, and would whether, they scout at, like, sorry? caravan parks and stuff like that? No, because... Um, or at least as far as I know, those do not count as addresses in the ABS right. register. Yeah, there, there are there are shortcomings to this. And you have to be very careful when interpreting these statistics that you have a probably a small population, but as economic situations get more and more dire, a growing one, who aren't counted here. It's one of those things that, like, a lot of these statistics, you have to be careful about edge cases, just when it comes to interpreting them and using them for policy. I mean, if you want to do <laughs> shit about those people, at least. I like to. Our current government, not so much, right? And, speaking of governments, on to the politics. Australia had a federal policy of full employment from 1946 to 1967. A very merry fuck you to Malcolm Fraser mm -hmm. for ending that one. What this means is that there is a government mandate that all people who can be employed should. They should have work available to them, which could include government jobs, for example. This was abandoned in favour of the idea that there is some natural level of unemployment, about 5%. The reserve nominally. army of labour, as Marx would say. <laughs> yes, the <laughs> coercive arm, as perhaps it would be better phrased. Right. So below this... It is thought, according to this family of economists anyway, or this body of theory, that there is inflationary pressure, i.e. the shortage of people available to do labour means that the pressure on wages goes up, prices start to rise because wages are going up, and that's what is called inflation. If you have higher unemployment, you have deflationary pressure. So because there is a greater pool of labour who are available to work, there is downward pressure on wages and hence downward pressure on prices. This was pioneered by that dickhead Milton Friedman as the natural rate of unemployment. It's been updated because that's perhaps a little too on the nose. Uh, other economists call it the non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment, as in doesn't push inflation. They don't so much care if it gets a little bit higher because, you know, downward pressure on wages is a good thing, obviously. It saves money for the capitalists. But this is very much a push against Keynesian economics, which said full unemployment's a good thing, actually, if you can do it. I certainly don't agree with this one, because you can't measure this supposed natural state of unemployment, or natural level of unemployment. It's a hidden variable, if you will, Economists have no way of measuring it. Nobody else has any way of measuring it. It is, it is assumed to exist by this body of theory. And then people under that assumption still treat un the unemployed like shit because they're not pulling their weight or whatever else. So there, there is a political system which constructs this body of available labor, the unemployed, bludgeons them because uh, apparently they are not contributing to society, and then uses them as like an economic tool to put 
monetary pressure on the rest of the workers, effectively. Yeah, yeah. And this has, aside from the abuse that is leveled upon the unemployed, this has other policy implications as well. So if I can find it, here we go. This is from an ABC News story. This is the Reserve Bank of Australia's wage growth estimates are the coloured lines here, labelled by the years, and the darker line is the actual observed wage price index. So this comes from the same sort of surveys where the ABS asks people, what is your wage? How much are you earning per hour? And that sort of thing is where this data comes from. But you can see that uh, there have been some fanciful projections <laughs> in this period. The RBA has been projecting that there will be upward pressure on wages because unemployment has been low, below this imagined uh, non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment, natural rate of unemployment, whatever. If you assume that exists, if you assume it's about 5% or something, and unemployment is below that, your model says, ah oh, yes, wages should go up. In actuality, wages have not been going up. And over the past, oh, what is it, like 40 years now, 45 years since the 70s and 80s when this became a stylish economic policy, there has overall been a disconnect and wages have not really increased at all over that period, while the returns for capital have skyrocketed. Um, and that's not just in reflected in the full employment system, that is also in the disciplining and breaking of the labour movement and things like that as well. Oh yeah, because if you have a strong labour movement, if you have strong unions, that also pushes puts upward pressure on wages. And that's a bad thing, you see, because that <laughs> causes inflation, instead of helping people <laughs> to live comfortably. <laughs> So these projections, right, all of these decisions that the RBA has made based on its forecasts are, okay, we have to give employers more power. We have to tweak what we can in interest rates to put downward pressure on wages and things. And as you can see, downward pressure on wages has worked. Since like the, the global financial crisis, which is this bit, we had a bit above like there was some recovery from that in this period, but since then it's been a steady down decline in the ability of 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 labor to argue for better um, income Absolutely. conditions effectively. And this is the bit that really shits me to tears because it's so emblematic of the way that we structure society and we structure our lives. Everything is oriented around employing as few people as possible and extracting as much labor from them as for as little cost as possible. And this was chosen, right? Not by one individual, although Milton Friedman certainly had enough of a hand in that sort of thing, but by the evolution of how moneyed interests protect themselves that's what over I was say. centuries. When you say that you have a that you don't agree with everything about um, with Keynes, I actually think that the main problem with Keynes is that his ideas of having a balance between labour and capital in the way that he presented it was bound to lead to a political crisis that would lead to neoliberalism as we've seen it. Well, it still had capital structure is the thing. You still had capitalists owning the means of production, for example, which inevitably changes the the power balance and means that you have this pressure from the capitalists to protect themselves Absolutely. and protect their That's class what interests. I was getting at, but you were more articulate. <laughs> I have read a theory once. <laughs> But it could be different. So even if you don't necessarily adopt full ideas of worker ownership of the means of production, uh, which you should, frankly, it would be a much happier environment for many, many people. But the idea that we can't have central planning, for example, or we can't have like broader governmental controls on working conditions is just some bullshit. I mean, we have planned economies on the scale of countries. We just call them Amazon and Walmart. And in many respects, for the first time in human history, we really do have the technical infrastructure, the logistical systems, and the computational power to say, actually, there is a certain amount of work that needs to be done to keep everyone comfortable, safe, fed, all the rest of it. And there are so many people who can do that along some stratification of skills. We could distribute that labor to as many people as possible, so none of them are overburdened by it. 
and everyone does a little bit and then has time to themselves. There doesn't have to be this unemployment structure. There doesn't have to be this, like, you, you could have people move around within that system. And if you have, like, three people working 20-hour weeks as opposed to one person working 60-hour weeks, that gives those three people much more flexibility in what they want to do. And you can do it and say, we're just going to, like, more or less people keep doing the same thing as they are now, shift things around gently, and everyone stays fed. But you and I will never see such a radical change in our lifetime, unfortunately. <laughs> we can dream. Another thing in this framework is where the notion of full-time work even came from. In, let's say, imperial core countries, the labour movement during and after the Industrial Revolution pushed for a limit to the number of hours and days that a person could be required to do, because constant labour just destroys you. Slogans like, eight hours labour, eight hours leisure, eight hours rest, even the notion of a weekend where you were ex not expected to work, come from this time period. I really think that the history of the labour movement would be far more appreciated if people learned in school that the only reason we don't have child labour in a seven-day working week is the unions. There's a snag here, though. A choice was made, particularly during the 20th century, to emphasise full-time work for men outside the home in that framework. This ignores the labour that does at ho that is done at home because it, it's not seen as economically productive because you're not paid for it. To work a 40-hour week or more, not including commuting. You need someone at home doing the housework and providing childcare. This choice, this structuring of labour, really threw women under the bus, and it was a major sore point with the feminist movements at the time. Of course, God help you if you're a single parent trying to juggle multiple, joint, multiple jobs as well, or even just a single person trying to work full time and also do all that housework and whatever else for yourself. This goes towards one of the things we mentioned earlier. What labour is not counted in employment metrics? The biggest thing is unpaid housework and childcare. And I mentioned efforts by feminists in the labour movement. Wages for housework is one. So this started in like the UK and America and there's been like various international versions that are still going on and uh, particularly black feminists in the US. It started mostly in the 1970s and expanded to what's called the second shift in a lot of second wave feminist stuff. So this is if you have women who do work in a traditional job earning money, they will frequently go home and do housework at home as well. So they yeah. get a second shift, if you will, in the home as well as in their work. What is interesting here is that the push for that sort of recognition, and I mean the reason we only see like 2013 is when the International Labour Organization really kind of embraced measuring that within its labour statistics, and many countries don't. And uh, general UN policies consider housework too <laughs> difficult to measure in terms of its economic impact which is just laziness as far as I'm concerned. In many respects, it's only in the past century when bureaucratic structures around unemployment really came into play. So unemployment benefits weren't exactly a thing prior to that period. There's also a piece where only very recently has anyone outside of the very wealthy been able to afford someone in the home as an exclusive homemaker. Working class women have always worked. They didn't have the economic option not to. The housework still needed to be done and wasn't counted towards old labour statistics, but it's now that the middle class women are working or not or have or living at home and doing just housework and being homemakers. That's where yeah. that push has really come from. Um, the other one, this was rarely practiced in the Soviet Union, but if you read the uh, Soviet Family Act of 1921, it was written by um, the feminist Bolshevik thinker Alexander Kolonte, and her thing was not wages for housework, it was nationalised housework. Yeah. I think it's a <laughs> bloody good idea. So the, yeah. Well, not just for um, to give people who are doing the housework in their own home some level of independence, financial independence and support, but also, not everyone can do their own housework. And people with disabilities who need that kind of home care should have that provided Absolutely. to them as well. So uh, what we have overall in terms of these labour statistics is an attempt to measure who is participating in capitalist value creation or value extraction, depending on whether or not you say a landlord has a job, for example. 
but that particularly in Australia, you're missing measurements of a lot of work that happens because ABS hasn't quite implemented that sort of thing. And the Australian federal government, which sort of kind of controls the uh, ABS, has also decided to not make those changes because that could measure some things that may not be politically expedient for them. All right, that's our main episode. Now we're on to the mailbag segment. This one is from partner of the show, my partner, Dean, actually. He uh, asked me to look at a right-wing talking point that's been going around about COVID vaccination. So absolute ghouls like Stephen Crowder are trumpeting this, so you know it's quality. The statistic is that countries with very high vaccination levels, let's say 90% or above, so in these countries with these high vaccination rates, you can have maybe two-thirds of your hospitalized COVID patients actually have been fully vaccinated. But this does not account for the relative size of the populations of vaccinated and unvaccinated people. So Stephen Crowder and his ilk are arguing that this means that actually vaccines aren't effective and you shouldn't get it, which is ironic given that it seems to be killing an awful lot of his fan base at the moment. Anyway, so when we say relative risk to the population, you can't just say, oh, two thirds of hospitalized patients, that means you're at more risk than if you are unvaccinated. You have to take into account the fact that 90% of your population has had the vaccination. So let's invent some numbers and see what that means. Imagine we have a country with 100,000 people. (laughs) I like round numbers, they're nice to work with. So under that you have 90,000 vaccinated. 10,000 unvaccinated. And let's say that 60 people are in the hospital for COVID. So if that's two thirds are hospitalized and vaccinated, that's 40 of the 60 people. And the other 20 are unvaccinated. Yeah, I can see where you're going here. (laughs) Oh, good. Yes. So to get a meaningful measure of risk, you need to compare this 40 to this 90,000 and the 20 to the 10,000. You can't compare the 20 to the 40 directly. So let's calculate. 40 divided by 90,000 is one in 2,250 people as a rate or 0.0004 which is uh, 0.04%, right? You times this by 104 moves to there. Among the unvaccinated, you have 20 divided by 10,000, which is one in 500, or 0.002, which is 0.2%. So, This is four and a half times higher than the rate among the vaccinated people. So you are way more likely to be hospitalized if you are unvaccinated, even though the total number of unvaccinated people in hospital is lower. This relative risk versus the absolute number thing shows up a lot in politics when people uh, wish to disguise what happens to a small population compared to a big one, for example. It's a conservative talking point that more white than black people are killed by the police in the US. So clearly police violence has no race component then. However, uh, if you account for the size of the black population compared to the overall population, black people are way more likely to be killed by police in America. Of course, the police shouldn't be killing people (laughs) on the street anyway but that's some, well, that's a discussion for another time indigenous right indigenous americans are killed at the highest rate of any of the populations oh yeah it's <sighs> indigenous people get a shit time in general so dear listener if you have a statistic you'd like us to talk about drop us a line on twitter at stat in sig pod or an email via statistically insignificant pod at protonmail.ch 
Both of these are in the episode description. But oh, thank you so much again for, for putting uh, up with me. Thank you for showing me the way. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this is the way. I'll talk to you next time. Speak to you then. <laughs>